My name is Helge. I'm with a company called Offersen. Hopefully you know us. We are here. We are sponsoring today. And um, I'm going to give, if you were here yesterday and, and, and attended my talk, it is pretty much going to be the same talk. So in that case, you might consider uh, attending one of the parallel tracks, unless uh, you want to see how to do the same thing, but using uh, Postgres, in which case you should most, most definitely stay. All right. Cool. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to say a little bit about why I'm giving this, this talk today. So who has read this book uh, called Sen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? At least one. OK. Uh, it's one of my favorite books. It's not really a book about motorcycle maintenance, or sand philosophy for that matter. Um, uh, to me, it's really a book about you know, passion and passion for your craft, um, which in my case is, is software and, so, uh, and data science. Um, and that's why I, I also really enjoy attending these conferences and why Offersen is at these conferences, to meet other people with uh, passion for the same thing. Offersen's uh, kind of philosophy or um, is that um, talent is, is universally distributed, but opportunity is not. Um, so there's a lot of people in, in companies, very talented people, but maybe not working on things that make them passionate um, or where they really feel inspired by their work. So this is one of the things we are trying to, to address. Um, we're usually known as the place you go where you want, if you want to get a job. But actually, we do a lot more than that. Uh, there are a lot of people who are very happy where they are, and they like to stay. So we also have started doing some offerings for them. So I'm just going to uh, quickly talk about that. One is Source, which is a place where you can get help if you want to share some of your work uh, in blog form. So if you want to write an article about what you do or what you learned at PostgresConf, or you an article on your talk at, at PostgresConf, then you can check out source, and there's people there to actually go and help you uh, craft your IDs and with the structure and all that stuff around that. Uh, we also have Make. The idea behind Make is that normally you are too occupied uh, where you work to really learn new things because you're so busy doing what you regularly do. So if you want to do something like doing face recognition with Postgres. Um, maybe your boss isn't going to be too happy about that if that's not very relevant uh, to your work. So, so make, we call it a make day. And the idea is that you take a day's leave and you come in and you get to play with tech. So right now we're doing one on augmented reality. And if that's something you've been interested in, in working on, you know, you can come and learn about that in a very relaxed, uh, free environment. Um, the projects, we're going to say they should have a low floor and a high ceiling. If you want to go very far, you can do that, and very wide walls. So there's a lot of scope to do whatever you want. Uh, so we have one make space in, in Cape Town, close to our office in gardens, and we also have one uh, here in Johannesburg in Rosebank. And we run weekly, weekly make courses. And at the moment, I'm building, I'm busy uh, developing run, one around data science. So if that's something that's interesting to you, uh, please come talk to me. Now, to get to my actual talk, which is titled Big uh, Data Machine Learning Using SQL for Developers. That's quite a, a mouthful, but I'm going to talk about each of the different parts. Um, but I'm going to do it in reverse order. So I'm actually going to start with the developers. So why for developers? Um, well, this actually came from, we were looking at the numbers the, um, of the people who are involved in software in South Africa. And what do they actually, how many are there of the different type of candidates in, in the market? And, and from my analysis, I found that there's roughly a 100,000 people who consider themselves software developers in South Africa. But there's a, 
only about 1,000 that call themselves data scientists or something related to that. So given the excitement about data science and machine learning and all these things at the moment, it was quite puzzling that we aren't, there aren't more people doing more things with it. So that's one of the things we want to try and address. And the second reason uh, <coughs> I say developers um, should maybe consider getting more into, into doing data science is that they often have a very good understanding of the business where they, where they work, a very good understanding of the data, right? They usually wrote the code that is generating the data. And at the end of the day, we want the data science and the machine learning to drive the products. And that's obviously also where the developers are very strong. So, so this slide just shows something called the CRISP um, DM, which is a, just a model for how to do data mining. But it all shows that um, software developers already tick quite a number of boxes in this model. And the things that um, are maybe need to, they need to learn a bit more about is how to prepare data for modeling, how to do the actual modeling, and how to evaluate uh, those models. So I'm going to talk about mostly about those, those aspects of the thing. The other thing, OK, so let's work our way backwards. So why SQL? So if you were here at my talk yesterday, I talked about Spark and how Spark can be used to connect to a whole range of different database backends, Postgres, MySQL, Elasticsearch, Redis. Um, but what if you have all your data already in uh, Postgres and you don't really use any of the other systems? Now you have to get all this data out into another system where you do then do all your machine learning and data science. And you have to do everything there. And then you generate some output. And now maybe you need to bring it uh, back in again to your operational data. Um, database, which is, is a lot of work, maybe a deterrent for a lot of people. Um, so today I'm going to do, do the thing the other way. So I'm going to show how to do kind of machine learning on uh, Postgres, this being a Postgres conference. Uh, so the next thing is why, why do we want to do uh, machine learning in the first place? Or what is it really all about? So a lot of things have been said about this and in different ways. But to me, it's really kind of a paradigm shift. So usually we, we write a computer program to do something. And it looks something like this, a lot of if statements, if this, do that, if that, do this, and so on. But Imagine doing something like we did, we saw this morning uh, with the face recognition. Like, how do you write a program that recognizes somebody's face? That is almost impossible, right? Because you don't know how everybody's faces are going to look. So, machine learning kind of shifts the ID, and instead of having a program looking like that, we have something looking like this. Like we have a lot of examples. We have a lot of data. And we're saying, hey, we, we don't know actually how to solve this problem, but here's a lot of examples. Here's a lot of faces. This is how they look like. And here's an example of, you know, Cobus's face or Malcolm's face or whoever. Um, and we say, this is an example of that. And you need to be able to recognize it. We don't care really how you do it. You just have to do it. That's what we're telling the machine. And the machine will then learn how to perform the underlying task. Okay, so that's, to me at least, that's the fundamental idea behind uh, machine learning. And finally then, big data. Why do we care about big data? Well, big data is a, is a problem. We have big data. Like, we're generating a lot of data from our cell phones, from our online interactions, from our online purchases, 
um, all that is just contributing to this enormous amount of data. So that's the problem, and we like to use it all. But obviously, uh, performing a analysis or computing on this on this data is very very expensive. Uh, there being so much of it, so that's why we have big data tools that help us do a lot of things in parallel and a lot of things quite efficiently. So we don't want to be in this situation where we're sitting and waiting for a model to train or for analysis to run. We want the tools to do all the heavy lifting for us and give us results that are useful in a reasonable amount of time so that we can get on with the work and do more awesome stuff. So that's a bit about the why. Um, <coughs> so what I'm going to talk about specifically today is this framework called Madlib. So it's an Apache project. Apache Madlib, big data machine learning in SQL. It's open source, you can run it on Postgres um, or Greenplum. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, quite, it's quite actively developed. Um, and it's got pretty good good documentation. And it's an extension that you install for Postgres. And once you've installed it, you can basically start using it. So the way I'm going to use it, I'm going to use it together with the Jupyter Notebook, or through the Jupyter Notebook. So who is familiar with Jupyter Notebook? So a couple of people, not, not not everyone. So the Jupyter Notebook is like a data scientist's uh, lab or lab equipment and research um, experiments all in one, right? So this is kind of where we work and can try different things out with the data and different models and see what works, what doesn't work, and get results uh, immediately. So it's a web interface and it consists of these cells that you see here. Um, and you can uh, write Python code that will execute uh, within these cells like that. And you can even do inline plots. So you can do something like um, plot random numbers if you want to, and it gives you the the um, the plot in line. So that's quite quite useful uh, if you're working uh, with uh, with in data science. Um, it's quite an interactive experience. And um, it's also got these things called magics. So magics are just that, magic. It um, saying load the magic, and when you have that, so there's one called the SQL magic, which, which lets you connect to pretty much uh, uh, most of the major uh, SQL databases. So this is how you would connect to the a Postgres database, in this case running it on my local machine, and um, my username as a schema. Um, but it could be running in the cloud, it could be running on your own cluster, wherever. And I've actually already installed Madlib on my local system. So I can just get the version and check that everything is okay and uh, it's compiled, uh, all the data around that. And then what you do, you can uh, use this magic, which is two percentage signs in SQL. And that tells then the Jupyter Notebook that the content of this um, cell is a SQL query. And it will then actually go and run that. And you'll get your results back into the, into the Jupyter Notebook. And you can do things with it here going f forward. Uh, so that's all very nice. Um, cool. So I'm going to... 
next show you an example of us doing something with, with this uh, setup. So the example that I'm going to talk about is recommendations. So that's the classic case where you have a customer bought some items and you want to suggest other things um, for them to buy. To make it a little bit more concrete, let's, let's maybe take uh, take a lot. So you're on take a lot, you're buying a laptop, and now you're getting the laptop, and now you realize you have to carry this laptop around in your hands. That's not very nice. It would be great if take a lot recommended to you uh, a, a laptop bag, which you could have bought when you bought the laptop, and you get both of the items at the same time, and you're very happy. So that's the basic idea behind uh, recommender systems. Um, so we're gonna gonna have a look at that. Um, so this is basically my data, right? Uh, so it is a it's very simple. It's two columns. The one is my ID column, and it gives me an ID of the transaction. So that all the items, all the rows with the same ID. Uh, means that they were far, far from, from part of the same transaction. Uh, so these were things that were bought at the same time. And then it basically just gives a, a brief description of what, what that item was. So now our task is to kind of try and learn from this data what kind of things are usually bought together so that the next time somebody um, maybe buys a laptop, then we're going to recommend to them, hey, maybe you want to buy a laptop bag. And the algorithm that we're going to use is a sort of classic data mining algorithm called association rule mining. This is very simple. Uh, you compute a few quantities. The one is the support. So if X and Y, in this case, is your laptop and your laptop bag, you will calculate the support for laptop for those items being together, which is just the probability that we see the, both of those items. So it's the frequency of those divided by all the possible items. Um, we also compute the confidence, which is the conditional probability of buying one item with the other. And this can change. So the probability of buying a laptop bag, given that you're buying a laptop, is probably higher than buying a laptop given that you bought a laptop bag. Why? Because very few people will uh, go online and buy a laptop bag and then get a recommendation of a laptop to go with the nice laptop bag. That's, that's generally not how it works. It's, it's usually the other way around, right? So uh, that is confidence. And then there's the final quantity that we're interested in is called lift. And that tells us intuitively how, um, how, f how much more frequently do these two items um, happen together or, or observed together than assuming they were independent, right? So um, how important is it that these, these two items are, are together? Um, so this is just an example of where we calculated these quantities. So let's think of the rule A, D in this case. So there's shopping carts. It's got A, B, C, D uh, items in them. And so the rule A, D will have support 2 over 5, because out of these five cases, um, two of them contain both A and D. It will have uh, confidence. 2 over 3, right? Because in 2 of the 3 um, cases where you found D, you also found A. And it will have lift um, basically 10 over 9. That cal calculation is a little bit more tricky, but basically because it's 10 over 9, which is greater than 1, it means that those two items are found more frequently together than independently, which would be of interest if you're trying to do recommendations. So let's see how this works 
using Madlib. So this is how you would call call a, a function in Madlib. So Madlib gives you a set of functions that you can call. Um, in this case, it already supports association rules. It's in the library. Uh, you can go and read the documentation about how that works. And as you see, you uh, give it a support and confidence. So these are thresholds. You don't want, for instance, in our, in our take a lot example, if somebody um, bought a laptop bag together with, um, say, a bottle of shampoo by accident, that's not very interesting if that happens, because that probably happens very infrequently. And we don't want to be then be recommending the shampoo because somebody bought, bought a laptop uh, with it. But if, it's happen, if it happens quite frequently, then we will be a lot more interested in it. So that's why we set these thresholds. So we say we, we need a minimum support, we need a minimum confidence uh, for these things to be interesting. And then there's a few other things like what is the what is the name of the column that contains those IDs? What is the name of the column that contains those uh, descriptions? What is the input table we're coming from? Uh, where do we want output to? Those are the most important uh, parameters to, to specify with this function. And that's really all that's to it. If you run that, you're going to get some output. And if you do a select star from that, you're going to find that it found 122 rules that satisfy this. So there's 122 relationships that it, it thought was interesting. And that's basically it. Now you can maybe go and look at them, which is what we're doing here. So it will output those rules that it found into this table called associ association rules and together with the support, confidence, and lift. So what I've done here, I've sorted by, ordered by lift to get the most, the, um, the rules with the highest lift uh, first, the most inter interesting things first. And yeah, you can see things like a pillow with a mattress, which kind of makes sense, a brush, brush and a toothpaste, presumably a toothbrush. Uh, a mouthwash, toothpaste, uh, bread and butter. So these things kind of seem to make sense. And you can see here that it's quite a uh, high lift. So uh, that means basically these are more frequently found together than, than a pot. Uh, and now you've got this in this table called association rules. And you can, if you're a developer, you can um, basically just query on this column. So if somebody then goes and adds mouthwash to their shopping cart, you can say, hey, maybe you also want to buy some toothpaste with that. Uh, and that's presumably then a good, good recommendation. And yeah, and it's, it's all there in your, in your DB um, for you to use. So the final thing I just want to touch on is how do we know if, if, if uh, the recommendation it's is generating is, is, is any good. So there's a whole range of performance metrics that are commonly used in machine learning that you can use. One of the popular ones is this one called uh, precision and recall. So the idea behind precision is if you make a certain number of recommendations, um, how many of them were good? good ones. So how many, in how many cases did the person actually buy that item? Um, and if you also have uh, some historical training data, you can calculate the recall. And the idea behind there is uh, like how many recommendations did you miss? Like how many things could you recommend that you, that you didn't and kind of lost? And these two are kind of in a trade-off against each other. So it has to do with your confidence. Um, in the prediction you're making. So you can ma make that threshold very, very high, in which case it's going like to make very few recommendations that it's very certain of. Usually your precision will be very high then, but your recall would be a lot lower, and vice versa. If you set that threshold very low, 
um, then you will recommend a lot of items. A lot of them will be wrong, so your precision will be low, but then again, your recall, like the ones you should have gotten right, you will get right. Uh, so usually you want to find an, a nice balance between, between those two points. Mm, just some resources if you want to look, look further so into this. Um, this was a, it's a very simple, simple method, but the idea behind all machine learning methods and also um, sort of cutting edge things around deep learning is basically the very much the same thing. Uh, it's about finding interesting, interesting patterns and encoding those. So you, this was a course that's recently been made public from um, fast.ai. Fast so if you go to fast.ai, it's got like practical deep learning for coders and cutting edge deep learning for for coders and it's very developer friendly introduction to the recent ideas in, in deep learning and the cutting edge things there. Um, and that's pretty much the end of the talk, but I'm happy to take uh, questions of course if there are any. Um, thank you. So I'm looking at this, uh, the Postgres presentation, and I'm trying to, in my mind, compare to what, what would be the trade-offs with the no uh, no uh, no SQL database and the Spark um, uh, laid on top. Well, what, when will you uh, use the one approach, and when will you use the other approach if you had to design the system from scratch? Cool. Um, so the question is, if I understand it, what about NoSQL and what about Spark and when would you use Spark and when would you use Postgres? Um, so I'd say um, you, you would consider using Postgres definitely if, if all your data is already in, in pro Postgres, obviously, or you're ru already running a green plum um, data for your data warehouse, that's a massively parallel architecture you already deployed and you're already uh, running it, so you can then leverage that immediately for, for do, to do all your heavy lifting for you, so you don't have to set up another Spark. I think, I mean, the tools around Spark is a lot more mature, there's a lot more things supported, a lot more f functionality in Spark. Uh, Madlib is not one of the prominent machine learning libraries, um, but it is if you just want to get started with this stuff and you don't feel like setting up a whole different system to do all your data processing. Um, and maybe if you're already familiar with the syntax using Postgres, learning Spark and learning MapReduce and learning uh, all the things around that can be quite a steep learning curve. So I think this is, if you're an <laughs> existing user of Postgres, you will find this quite easy to work with comparably. Um, but if you're getting really serious about it, probably you want to start looking at other things. Yeah. Cool. Are there any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. <coughs>